Hello, and welcome to the series finale of Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Centre for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Office Coordinator at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. As we listen to the sounds of a garden path at Hasegera in Kamakura, Japan, this week we are joined by Toshio Watanabe, Professor of Japanese Art and Cultural Heritage at the Sinsbury Institute, to discuss gardens of war memory, going over his latest project of transnational gardens across the Pacific with ties to the Asia-Pacific War. Toshio invites us to consider gardens as spaces of memory and healing, but also as reminders of colonialism past and present across former territories of the Japanese Empire throughout Asia. We also look at gardens as peopled places, looking at the motives for visitors coming to these places. Do they come for the memories or just to enjoy nature? We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Toshio. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So now I normally begin my episodes by asking my guests what their area of expertise is, but given your expansive academic career, I think you'd better tell us what your areas of expertise are and which one in particular we will be looking at today. Thank you, Oli. Uh, it all started with my 1984 PhD for the University of Basel in Switzerland. And this was on high Victorian Japanism, which eventually got published in 1991. Since then, I worked mostly on Anglo-Japanese relationships in architecture, art, craft, and design. But then, about 15 years ago or so, I thought I'd like to start something new and a bit different, and started to work on the topic of transnational Japanese gardens. See, and it's a sort of extension of my Japanese studies. And this also fitted nicely with my change of role within the University of Arts London, uh, where I then worked, because uh, I was then appointed Director of Research Centre for Transnational Art, Identity and Nation, TRAIN, in 2004, and worked for TRAIN until my retirement from UL. Uh, then uh, I moved to the St. Perry Institute as part-time professor. So that's sort of my career path. Uh, when I worked mostly on Japanese. Uh, but what really gave me a strong push to look into the history of Japanese gardens was when Professor Tom Reimer of the University of Pittsburgh asked me whether I could write an overview of modern Japanese garden in 8,000 words for his book, Since Meiji, uh, which was then published in 2012. I was always interested in this topic but has worked on the subject only in bits and pieces and not systematically before. So, but then what I found, uh, found out was the really surprising lack of the publication on Japanese colonial gardens. There was a huge yawning gap. Nobody seemed to have been, to have been interested in it. Thankfully, the situation has changed since but when I thought maybe I should do something about that, but the topic was just simply too large to do on just my own. And there must have been many thousands of them because any buildings uh, built by the Japanese, the colonizers, must have had at least one garden. Public building and also, for example, in Korea, many uh, sort of housing were built in Japanese style rather inappropriate for the climate of Korea. And uh, also, I didn't have the right languages. Uh, you needed certainly Chinese and Korean and probably Russian and some probably dialect of Chinese, etc. So I came to today's topic by my interest in Japanese, then transnational Japanese gardens, then colonial gardens, and finally, to the issue of today, war and gardens. And currently uh, I'm preparing a large funding bid entitled Gardens and the Memory of Asia Pacific War. And together uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Eriko Tomizawa Kei, who is a colleague uh, at the University of East Anglia. And uh, 
even if we don't get the funding, because these days funding success ratios are so low, uh, we aim to uh, publish a book anyway, but maybe with less field work covered. I see. Fascinating. Now, as a fellow researcher of sites tied to war memory in Japan, I can confidently say there are many kinds of sites worthy of research, ranging from memorials to shrines to former military facilities. What drew you to gardens in particular, and what connections with war memory have you found there? Thank you, uh, Ali. Uh, of course, uh, you wrote a fascinating article on war heritage sites in Kyoto, a place not usually associated with such things. Mm. And I love these sort of unexpected connections. And I found also a lot in uh, during my research on this topic. Uh, as I said, uh, for me, my first interest was Japanese colonial gardens. And then obviously this led to Japanese garden created during the war. And um, while we were preparing a project on this at the UAL, uh, it was suggested that probably we should also include uh, what happened after the war, how these things were uh, remembered. And I thought that this was a brilliant idea. Um, but then uh, with my retirement from UAL, the Japanese gardens during the war project had to be abandoned. But I continued to be the idea of the post-war memory aspect when I came to the Saintsbury Institute. Because, as I said, it had so much unexpected new connections. And so, as I said, my interest first was garden. And the memory issue came later, but then became one of the central issues of this project. I see. Now, uh, which gardens would you recommend our Japan-based listeners go and see? Okay, uh, how much time you have, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, just to make it simpler, I wanted to group in three groups uh, to make it simpler. And the first group is a group of gardens related to sort of commemoration of the war in Japan. And the most famous one is, of course, Yasukuni Shrine, the gardens related to it, because for this research, I include garden-like environment. So, in fact, the entire uh, Keidai, uh, the area of Yasukuni, would be included. But also in Yasukuni's case, it has its own Japanese garden sort of at the back. Lots of people don't realize it's a sort of what the so-called traditional Japanese garden is there. Uh, but there's also a less well-known garden, which is more my focus, which is the Chidori Gafuchi National Cemetery. Chidori Gafuchi is more famous for its cherry blossoms because it's uh, alongside one of the Edo Castle moat. And at the edge of those cherry trees, there's a quite small, in, in one way modest, uh, cemetery. But it has only, uh, it doesn't have any tombstones, just one building. And it's a modernist cemetery, beautiful, clean cut design. And the interesting thing about uh, this Chidori Gafuchi is that it is actually owned by the nation. So a ministry is directly involved in it, uh, and it's a national cemetery for uh, the war dead, anonymous war dead, and it, whereas Yaskuni is only for the soldiers, uh, uh, the military dead, but uh, for the Chidori Gafuchi, both civilian and the military but no foreigners. It's a national cemetery. And uh, uh, it's really fascinating uh, because uh, there are lots of uh, events happening and uh, I can recommend it. It's very quick. If you are around that area, it's a nice walk and uh, uh, going around the Imperial Palace and just pop in there. So I can strongly recommend it. And the third one in this category I like to recommend is a highly esoteric one, 
which is the Kaiten Memorial Museum in Ozushima in the Inland Sea area. And it's not very easy to go there, uh, though you can use the bullet train and then take a short boat trip. Uh, and this is a memorial museum of Kaiten, which is the suicide uh, submarine, which was invented toward the end of the war. And the whole island was uh, the base of this. And there are various commemorative places, but the entire island is really not touristic. When I went there, all the boat guests had fishing rods. So they were off to fishing all day in this island. And uh, for me, this is, has also personal connections because my youngest uncle actually was a Kaiten uh, pilot or uh, mm -hmm. navigator. And he was actually one of the four who died at their first sojourn to fight the Americans. And apparently they sank a merchant uh, uh, Navy ship. Uh, I want to research in the American archive as well, because very often the victories of the war from the Japanese side are very often exaggerated, let's say. Mm. And so uh, because, because it was the first sojourn, uh, uh, his name is Watanabe Kozo, and in all the books uh, which uh, deals with uh, Kaiten, he appears. So, and also I have, I gathered from my uh, aunt who was very close to him, uh, a whole archive uh, of him. So I want to include that. And it has a very nice garden and in the garden, they're actually not inside, but outside they're sort of like a memorial stones uh, with each name there. It's a very nice place. And this is a more sort of a family related thing. Okay, so that was a commemoration of the war in Japan. And the second one is the commemoration of peace in Japan. And these are obviously the famous peace parks. Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the really obvious ones. But what really uh, piqued my interest were the numerous smaller peace parks scattered all over Japan, sort of almost randomly. And even within Tokyo, there are several, and mostly they are run by the Boroku. And another interesting thing about these peace gardens is that they are not built immediately after the war, but more like in the 60s and afterwards. Some of them are quite a lot also in the 80s, and most of them are very much related to nuclear disarmament movements, you see. So for example, the recent one I visited, Auto, is again run by the Boro, uh, but uh, very often they rename existing public parks and put peace on top, Heiwa Kohen. But in Auto's case, they even got some presents from both Nagasaki and Hiroshima to authenticate their space, though they, ha they haven't been bombed, but they have like uh, burnt bricks and so on there. So it's again an artificially created peace park. And there seems to be quite a lot of them. So I'm very much interested. And also another really esoteric one is in Kuchiyama in Kyoto district, which sort of vanished from the record. And uh, I found one uh, in my study, but then Fukuchiyama's public uh, notices, it doesn't appear. And only thanks to TripAdvisor, some intrepid American tourists went there and it's completely derelict. So this is again, so fascinating from the memory issue. Yeah, maybe Oli, once you're in Kyoto, maybe you can try to find out. Yeah, definitely stop by. <laughs> yeah, so that's Fukuchiyama. Uh, it seems to have been an army cemetery before, but again, why do you neglect such things? That's one of the things we have to get on with once we start it properly. And so the third one is I created a separate category, war memory of a place still under colonial conditions. And that is of course, Okinawa. And there are the help from Eriko, Dr. Eriko, uh, Tomizawa Kei would be extremely helpful because she is 
specialist on Okinawan art. And it's a, such a complicated situation. But it is clear, a lot of Japanese don't realize it, but it is completely under double colonial conditions from Americans and the Japanese. And this is reflected in various peace park and monuments where the will of the Okinawans are very often skewed and twisted by the Japanese authorities. And that's one thing I really want to go in because uh, this is a really special conditions where the only place where the war, colonial history isn't over in the sort of daily life. Okay, uh, maybe I should stop here for this question. Sure. Thank you, it's a wonderful list and I'll definitely have to make a point of visiting all these places next time I'm out in Japan. Uh, so some of the gardens you've researched were made during the wartime of the Asia-Pacific War. Why were public funds going to creating gardens in a time of total war and what has become of them since? Okay, uh, one thing when I talk about this, lots of people think still this is about Japanese garden, but it is not. And it is really Japanese gardens are only part of it. I mean, it does include, uh, they do include, but uh, it's a lot is about other people who were involved with this war. And uh, okay, so I come to that later, but um, what happened the gardens built during the war. Some are extremely special circumstances. For example, in the United States, once the Pearl Harbor happened in December 1941, President Roosevelt uh, simply said, no Japanese Americans can live at the coast because the collaboration here, you see, and you can't protect the entire West Coast. So the Japanese Americans were all uh, brought together and put in the internment camp. It's euphemistically called relocation centers, but no, it is basically internment camp. And the one I was interested in, I visited is the internment camp Manzana, which is sort of uh, in the deepest part of California towards uh, Las Vegas and Owens Valley, which is sort of a desert condition, but it has a river, so it has water. And it's a really lovely place. And uh, Sierra Nevada mountain range. And uh, the thing is, it was started, the ideas, basically between 1942 and 1945, they were there. And then after that, it became a derelict place. But because the West Coast garden business was a lot of them run by the Japanese. And I think actually in Los Angeles, I think it was more or less a monopoly of the Japanese Americans. There were about 400 out of 10,000 internees who were specialists. So gardens created within this camp were actually real beautifully designed gardens, many of them, and they even had competitions, you see? So it's a very special case. And what interests me and why I have included this is how they are dealing with it now. The visitor center and actually out of all people, President Reagan uh, actually rescinded the sort of uh, persecution on the Japanese Americans and apologized formally to the Japanese Americans that uh, what they did, you see. And it became more or less kind of a repentance monument because it's a national park. So it's a federal place and uh, uh, lots of school parties come here and hear negative information about the USA's war effort, see, which is, Fascinating, I want to study a bit more on that aspect. And then the, the other gardens, uh, uh, obviously not many war related gardens were built within Japan, but the many were built in the colonies. And I just found one example in Hong Kong uh, where 
In fact, it was on the Christmas day of 1941 when finally the British surrendered uh, to the Japanese. And of course, at 1945, uh, they had to return it. So it again, it was uh, only these few years. And I found a postcard in the collection of the Hong Kong University Museum, which showed a garden scene and it says Taisho Koen. Uh, you see Taisho Park, and which is actually uh, now a botanical garden and also a small zoo is also attached there. It's like a jungle. But the interesting thing about this garden is the Japanese simply made into Japanese colonial garden by changing the name, not the design. See, and uh, the postcard is a written evidence of that. And they eventually wanted to build a Hong Kong shrine there, but all came to nothing in 1945. So, I mean, that's another aspect. I don't know how much I could go into researching the various colonial garden, but let's see how it goes. I'm particularly intrigued by the idea of a repentance memorial in the US. I mean, I've that's, that's, it's, so, it's so rare and it's so, I think it's been very difficult in America to address contentious aspects of the military past. So to hear that there's an example amongst gardens is uh, really fascinating. Yeah, actually I could add to that, but once I was in Hiroshima Peace Park and it was winter, so it was cold and it was not a sort of travel season, but there were several uh, American, I think sort of primary school, groups and there were about three of them going round and round and I just sneaked up behind them and I was so touched because the teachers were telling the story again the more sort of American dependence thing and they did the homework and how awful this is mm. because I also know that the uh, town where the uh, so-called I forgot the name uh, where the, I think the bomb was made, they they are all gung-ho. And this is a sort of our uh, victory memory kind of thing, because we are proud to make this atom bomb. But these American uh, sort of school groups were very well informed, probably much better than the Japanese sort of school groups. So I just wanted to add that. Now, uh, what kind of gardens have you come across which were created post-war, like these peace gardens you referred to earlier, and how does the commemoration of war there vary from wartime gardens? Well, uh, this is more or less the entire topic of research, <laughs> but I try to be short if I can. Uh, okay, because what I found is that all the gardens I found were all related about the memory of victimhood. The victimhood seemed to be a key word. And I think I want to dig in a bit more uh, once uh, proper research starts. It's a very interesting thing because what I found is that almost everybody think they're the victims. It's like Trump supporters think they are actually the victims. And obviously the Black Lives Matters activists, they think they are the victims. So the victimhood and anger seem to be one of that prime pressing point. And I want to do more digging to that more. So both say Manzana, Hong Kong, etc. what I'm interested in, what is the reception since? How are we dealing with those? Like in Manzana, it's really sort of on the federal level, they are constantly re remembered. Whereas in Hong Kong, the whole entire memory just vanished until I discovered this one postcard. I couldn't find any other documentation. Mm -hmm. see. So that's uh, regarding what uh, uh, happened, the garden created during the war, but what happened afterwards? Again, I want to um, uh, divide it into three uh, main uh, subject areas uh, to make it a bit more clear. One, the first one is war memory of the victors, Hong Wong. 
and particularly the Europeans and the North Americans, where except Pearl Harbor and very minor incidents, their own home territory weren't invaded. You see, and obviously they won at the end. And uh, here again, I just want to pick three examples. The first one is the Iwo Jima Monument in Washington, D.C., which is sort of a uh, famous Arlington Cemetery. It's all park-like landscape place. And, but it's actually the other side of the Potomac River. So it, in fact, it is in the neighboring state and not in, within D.C. But for intended purpose, we regard it as a Washington kind of uh, D.C. monument. Now, this is an interesting one because this is a huge monument, very realistic soldiers putting up the Stars and Stripes flag uh, once the Iwo Jima was conquered. Uh, famous battle, Clint Eastwood's uh, film is very moving. And of course, Watanabe Ken was the main protagonist there. And so lots of people regard it as one of those Asia Pacific War monuments, but actually it isn't. It's there only, it's only represented because the whole monument is not Asia Pacific War monument but monument for the Marines, U.S. Marines. Mm -hmm. So all the Marines history and achievements are commemorated. And the Iwo Jima is just represented as one of the greatest achievements. So it's only a representation of Marines success rather than Asia Pacific War. So that's again, an interesting case. And then the second one, probably very few people know it, and it's really esoteric one, and which is the National War Memorial Gardens outside Dublin. It has the most interesting history, and maybe we don't have time to go into it, but at one stage it's complete derelict, and then but it was revived, and now it's beautiful. It was designed by uh, Edwin Lutyens, a uh, famous architect, and just finished in the 1930s. But because by the time Ireland became independent, you see, and in one way, it was also mainly for the First World War, and the government didn't want to celebrate, sort of, in a sense, it's a British victory, you see. So, mm. though it was completed, it was never opened publicly. You see, and also when I went there, what about Second World War? See, because Ireland was actually neutral. It didn't join in, you see. So why? But it does actually commemorate also war debt, Irish war debt of the Second World War, because quite a number of them joined in the British army uh, as volunteers. And particularly in Southeast Asia, many of them died. So they are commemorated, but their memory is very ambivalent, you see, mm. and there's no word, just a date, you see, but again, that's something I want to dig into archive and find out how they deal with it. And the third one is really lovely one, and which is the most recent one, I think just finished uh, in Coventry, and it's a Japanese peace garden uh, organized also, in, uh, collaborated by Japanese Garden Society, which I'm a member too, and just, I think, completed. So I want to, again, look into the archive. I hope they have. Uh, so that's a really lovely one now. That's the first uh, of the uh, victors. And then the war memory of the colonies. Of course, the Japanese colony was huge and uh, all over East Asia and Southeast Asia. But just two examples, one in Beijing and one in Seoul. In Beijing, there's this gigantic museum uh, commemorating the victory of the Chi Chinese people's victory against Japanese. And it's vast uh, as a museum, very well run, very effective, dioramas and school parties, etc. 
But the side of it, it has a very modest, tiny garden. But it's a peace garden, see? Mm -hmm. And there's a complete difference from the museum's ethos and the garden. That the side, green, and it has a big, actually, uh, anti-nuclear sign on it, uh, which probably they didn't know, but they are saying is against war, not against Japanese. So that was my interest there. And another one is uh, a, a garden created in, I think, uh, 2016, uh, or was it 18? I uh, can't remember. Uh, but anyway, recently created in Seoul and uh, Lanshan Park, just if you, from the Myeongdon area, if you walk just 15 minutes or so, uh, walk and then just you climb up the little hill at the foot, there is uh, this uh, uh, park garden facility, which commemorate the comfort women. It's a huge issue, very current. You see, so I was very interested, but the garden itself is lovely. See, and when I went there on a Sunday, I stayed there two hours watching, watching, watching. And there were families there, uh, kids playing. So it was again, and the big stone in the middle message was again, peace, not war. See, so uh, that was for the colonize. And the third one is something completely different. And this is war memory as a leisure activity, basically games, manga, and anime. And this is really post about 1990s. And the uh, particular one I'm focusing on is uh, Kantai collection, uh, fleet collection, Kankore. Uh, and they are all the warships uh, of the Japanese Navy, all of them are named and they are used and each one of them has a female representation, each of them slightly different dress or sometimes rather undress and with each of them a different weapon. And they don't fight the allies, but they fight monsters, you see. It's just a game an extreme popular. I think the last count I've had sort of over 4 million people playing. And uh, also it is manga, uh, but uh, in Japan it's called uh, mixed media. So across different uh, YA novels, animations, and so on. And where's the garden? I came across it because I wanted to look into Shinto shrines and the war memory and Gokoku Jinja in particular. And when I, in the Hiroshima area, particularly where the Navy was very strong, Kure and so on, and I came across a Jinja, uh, Shinto Shrine, and uh, I Googled it, and there this website popped up. And they are what's called a guide to Seichi Junre. Uh, it's a pilgrimage guide uh, of these uh, games and manga and animes. So for Kankore, uh, there are several, and because the warships are very often commemorating specific Shinto shrines, like uh, many battalion in this country have a particular church where they have the sort of banners and so on. And uh, like I looked into warship Nagato, and it's uh, in Simiyoshi Jinja in Shimonoseki. I went there. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have actually a representation of Kankore, but we had a discussion uh, with uh, Shinto priest there. Very interesting. You see, and basically these fans turn up at these places in cosplay uh, uh, because individual girls, uh, you know, uh, you can identify and then take selfies. See, and then again, the guides say these are sacred places, so don't be sort of rude or respect and so on. And there's a lot of them. And also then there are other games also happening. The war games can be very popular. The, probably the best one is, it's called Garupan, Girls und Panzer, so half German. And it's uh, centered in Oarai town. 
and it's sort of girls high school fighting with panthers. It's, it's rather good, actually, the animations, very popular, you see, and there are various other ones. But what really fascinated me is I came across cosplay people who are actually Chinese tourists. What? <laughs> you see? And uh, these Chinese tourist girls dressed up in this Kankore girls and then doing selfies, you see. And then further on, I found also Chinese equivalent of war games, but this time the Chinese uh, Navy is all uh, victorious. But then I found there are lots of followers in Japan of those Chinese games. See, what's happening? You see? <laughs> so, so, so there's really this fascinating how in my mind, none of those youths have direct memory, but a sort of artificial memory is created. And according to Professor Sugawa at uh, Yokohama National University, she is really the guru of these studies. And I visited her and she said one really worrying thing is many of them read up on this uh, military history and most of them are really right-wing. So those uh, young people who are fairly ignorant and neutral became more and more right-leaning. See, so it's again, it has its darker side as well. Uh, maybe I should stop on this one here because I could go on and on. Sure. I think you've already touched on it a bit with, with your um, previous answer, but why do people visit these gardens today? Are the people specifically seeking out gardens for their war memory or do most who visit simply want to enjoy being in a garden? Yes, this is a very important question for me because I'm interested in any way the sort of artworks, sort of post-production history. Because like uh, if you're doing design history, half is production, half is consumption. Uh, whereas in fine art, the consumption history is only catching up these days. And for garden history, I find Professor John Dixon Hunt, uh, his book, Afterlife of Gardens, very inspiring. I mean, he's a really, one of the greatest garden historians we have. And uh, I really love it. So like um, in Chidori Gafchi, also in the Seoul and Kaiten Museum, you see, uh, all these uh, have a sort of different kind of reasons. And Chidori Gafchi in particular is fascinating because it's a national one. So you can't be one particular reason. That's why they couldn't actually build it in Yaskuni, because after the war, the GHQ made it as a private religious organization. So they can't have a national cemetery, you see. see. And they found a sort of an ex-aristocratic residence at the corner, and then uh, they created this. So it's not a very big place, but also it's very famous because it's all collect all the bones and ashes of fallen soldiers. They're now, uh, they, it's a government's obligation to find them. And uh, they are all uh, interned here in Chidori Gafchi. And it's how it's run, it's sort of friends of Chidori Gafchi, almost an amateur group is running it. And they have a website and they have timetable. And 15th of August is fascinating because it's the end of war day. So from 7 a.m., it's chock a block. One group after the other is using it. And it is really lots of different ones. And because of its national and can't be religious, one religion only. So in one, it's the most ecumenical space in the entire Tokyo. Because if you're Christian and you want to have an event there, you just book it and you can get a slot. Or if you have a Neo-Buddhist, see, or if you have a Shinto group, or if you have a sort of battalion, school groups, you see, it's a real mixture. It's a fascinating place, you see. And whereas like in Yaskuni, it's quite clear, it's just a war dead. And in fact, I did go uh, with my aunt because uh, my uncle is also commemorated there because he's, he's a soldier. 
is awarded. And what I mean, usually uh, progressive sort of uh, people avoid even going to Yaskuni, but because I went there as a family member, and the ceremony was a most beautiful, aesthetically satisfying. The dances of the Mikosan was so beautiful, and the Gagak music was really fabulous. But it's still a war memory place. Also, as I said, I include any garden like space. And uh, one interesting thing which I'm looking into this is for people visiting it is that gardens, unlike simple monuments, are also helpful to add the sense of well being. Because with COVID condition these days, we all know how important gardens are. If you are isolated, but if you have a garden of a simply even a little balcony with pot potted plants out there, you see, they give sort of kind of particular well-being help helpful thing. And I wanted to look into particularly Professor Goto of Nagasaki University, who is an artist, garden historian, collaborating with scientists and the real scientific experiments is being done and how. Japanese gardens directly related to well-being, particularly for the mentally ill people. And so, but I just wanted to dig in a bit more. This is an only recent sort of discovery. You've mentioned in your research that the memory of war is very diverse, ranging from anti-Japanese sentiments to a Japan as victim narrative. Could you share with us where you think these narratives are coming from? Yes. Uh, so in order to understand these narratives, I think we have to ask three major questions, which are really at the center of our investigations. Now, the first question is, why gardens? What are the characteristics of garden could provide for the remembrance of war memory? Other forms of remembrance cannot, like memorials, buildings, poems, films, photos, and so on. What is the specificity of the gardens? Now, this is the most important question for us, because I think gardens may be providing a productive way forward for the management of memories of Asia Pacific War, both for the perpetrators and the victims. See, that's the point. So then we hit the idea of approaching the issue of war memory from a very different angle. And uh, this is the history of cemeteries in general, because cemeteries are a place of memory of the dead, not specifically for war, sometimes it includes, see. And then from this history of cemeteries, specifically the modern development of the greening of cemeteries. And particularly from the 19th century to the early 20th century, there were movements to combine nature and graveyards together to create a more garden-like cemeteries. Let's uh, look into just some particular examples. Let's look at Germany. In Hamburg, at Ohlsdorf, a cemetery was created in the style, out of all things, um, English landscape garden, and this was 1877. And their website boasts that they are the largest cemetery in the world beautifully landscaped. In Munich, uh, in, the uh, uh, in Munich, we find the first, what's called uh, Waldfriedhof, forest cemetery, and this was created in 1907, and it became very popular in Germany. In North America, rural cemetery movements started from around the mid 19th century onwards, uh, where, um, cemeteries functioned as public parks, because at the time, public parks were not that prevalent in uh, North America. And then these cemeteries uh, provided places of recreation with art and sculpture. See, and what's in Britain? In Britain, uh, we have the garden reformer, William Robinson, uh, who proposed to apply garden aesthetics to cemeteries. And even, uh, in his case, he suggested removing tombstones and memorials. So just the garden itself 
or the memory of the dead. But this is a very radical idea. So the key to these developments uh, is aestheticization of cemeteries by making these into really beautiful uh, places and garden. So uh, this is a really interesting point for an art historian like me. So that was the first question, why gardens? Now, the second question is what kind of memory uh, is a particular garden trying to remember? Presenting a particular memory always involves choices. For example, in every case, the choice is made what to present and how, uh, there will be things which are missed or just not there. Therefore, any act of memory involves at the same time an act of forgetting, whether consciously or not. So this is the key question uh, we'll be asking for every individual case studies we are taking up. So what is the memory issue for this particular garden? That is a very important question for us. And now the third and final question we'll be asking is the nature of the victimhood. Um, more or less, all gardens under investigation are remembrance gardens of war victims. So the issue of victimhood is perhaps the most difficult one facing the project, as more or less every relevant group is seeing themselves as victims of war, victims of the war. To decide who are the perpetrators and who the victims is in often is often not straightforward and has to be done very sensitively, as I think many groups during the war were both perpetrators and victims. The Japanese are good examples. Uh, there were perpetrators on Nanji Massacre, um, Nanji Massacre, or in the Battle of Okinawa, but then the victims of the atom bomb. So these are the three questions. Now, what can we do about this? All suffer from the sense of victimhood, and they are very often based on anger, see, and woundedness. So we need healing. So many war memory gardens show more desire for peace than memory of brutality inflicted. In this, I see memorial gardens have a huge potential for healing. Thank you for answering all of my questions, Toshio. Uh, before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? Well, I think uh, I have almost too many. Oh no, definitely too many. But <laughs> uh, I would just say I uh, pick up four of them, which are really concrete uh, projects. And the first one I can mention is uh, I have a project. Uh, I'm joining the project at the University of Tsukuba. And this is the PI, our principal investigator is Professor Omka, an old friend of mine. And uh, it's on the network of Japanese artists in Britain uh, around 1880 to 1990. And I'm the overseas members and working on the watercolor movement as a third force of modern Japanese painting. And this is funded by the Japanese Research Council, JSPS. So I'm a member of that. And the second one uh, is uh, a project called World Ding Public Cultures, World and ING, and uh, the Arts uh, and Social Innovation. This is a large project uh, and um, a large international project involving uh, Canada, uh, Netherlands, Germany, and Britain. And uh, it's uh, actually based not at uh, St. Peter Institute, but at uh, uh, University of Arts London, my previous place of work. And it's uh, the principal investigator is Paul, Professor Paul Goodwin. And it's based at the uh, Research Center of uh, Transnational Art, Identity and Nation, TRAIN. And I'm a co-investigator there. And it's, a very, uh, it's funded by transatlantic uh, funding. Uh, and uh, what I can use this opportunity is that uh, there will be a, a big conference in December. Uh, it's all online you know, over several days. 
and uh, it's uh, called consent not to be a single being world in the Caribbean. And this is uh, in collaboration with the Tate uh, because at the Tate they are at the same time having a wonderful exhibition uh, on the uh, Caribbean artists. And many of the um, Caribbean artists active in Britain will be represented there too. And uh, here um, my contribution will be gardens as a public space. That's the second one. And the third one, uh, uh, I'm still in the process of applying a small grant, and this is on modern Japanese gardens in China. Uh, this is based uh, on the Sencha culture, uh, not uh, traditionally uh, known uh, tea ceremony with powdered matcha tea, but uh, what we usually drink, sort of green tea, but it has also its own culture, very much uh, centered on Chinese taste in Japan. I more or less finished uh, sort of three quarters. I just need some field work to finish it off. And the last one is completely different. And this is on Japanese post-war post knitwear design. Why? It has nothing to do with garden. It's actually <clears throat> very much a family-based uh, research because my mother, Ilse Watanabe, who is a German, <clears throat> She was uh, really one of the leading knitwear designer from 1948 uh, into the 1960s when she retired. And she published her first uh, monograph uh, of collection of knitwear designs in 1948, all in full color and uh, uh, not all, but most in full color. And um, uh, I think it may be for the first time when all the models were Westerners, and I appear as a grumpy little child wearing a, a sort of funny knitted shorts. Uh, you see, <laughs> sorry about that bit. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm really interested because it was also the period where the, uh, particularly the late 1940s, even when the first time when most of Japanese women actually were comfortable wearing Western style clothes, not the sort of kimono style. And uh, it's, it was before that, but uh, it become really the majority of clothing became uh, the Western style. And until uh, 1960s, uh, most school housewives were made uh, were making uh, clothing for their own families. So uh, pret -a -port, there was not that common. Uh, so therefore there was this huge boom in also knitwear as well. So I want to investigate that aspect as well. And also the issue of how, why the Western style, so the Western models became so popular. And even I appear there in some of them blonde and blue-eyed. Uh, I was never blonde, I never had the blue eyes, but simply the editor thought that would fit the image better, which is a wonderful example of sort of cheating kind of thing. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, but this is, uh, I found a collaborator and uh, it just, my contribution was just uh, uh, joining uh, probably uh, the conference and maybe publishing my article in the collected art, uh, essays, I collected um, papers, publication, but not as a formal uh, co-investigator. Uh, uh, but we don't know whether they get the money or not, so we are waiting. So these are the major four projects and I better finish there. Thank you very much. Great, Great. So that's a lot for our listeners to look forward to then. Thank you for joining me today, Toshio. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Olis. Thank you so much for inviting me. You can find a link to Toshio's research profile in the description below. This concludes the first series of Beyond Japan, and I would like to thank you all for tuning in and supporting the podcast over the last tumultuous year. We will be back in September with a roster of new episodes, starting off looking at Power Spots in Shinto with Professor Caleb Carter of Kyushu University and Hikikomori's in Mental Health with Dr. Chris Harding of Edinburgh University. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.